If you have looked at paintings and sculptures of Moses over the century, you would notice that there's something a bit scary, a bit odd about Moses. And to tell you why, I want to start with the Sistine Chapel. You see, Michelangelo, the guy who painted the Sistine Chapel, did not like his boss at all, Pope Julius II. And so when the Pope came to Michelangelo again to commission him and say, I need you to build something, uh, craft something, this amazing uh, piece of marble, this sculpture that will be at my tomb, uh, Michelangelo, you can't really say no, but he wasn't exactly excited about it. And, and so he sculpted this statue of Moses, and Moses has horns. Y'all ever seen this? If you look up Moses and horns, you'll find pictures all over the place. All of art across the middle centuries, whenever Moses shows up, he has horns. Why does Moses have horns? In ancient Hebrew, when there just weren't quite enough words to get across all the things that they were trying to, to express as, as Old Testament is being written. And so when Moses comes down the mountain, he has carrying the Ten Commandments, giving them to the people. We read literally, it says, and Moses' face, it puts the word horn and light. And so it's like a... They don't have the word cone, like a, a cone of light coming from his face. And, and so what's the nature shape that's kind of like a cone? Well, it's a, it's a horn. And so like a horn shape of, of light, the idea, the point being that Moses comes down off the mountain and his face is shining in, in kind of like his own personal flashlight. Um, but the literal word is there is horn. And for centuries, people kind of got it. And then this dude named Jerome, was the one who translated the Bible into Latin. And for some reason, he just had an off morning. I don't know. When he got to that particular verse, he translated the exact word. And he said, and Moses came down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments after talking to God. And behold, he had horns now. And so from then on, for centuries to come, every time you sculpted or painted Moses, he had horns. And, and by the time Michelangelo is creating this sculpture of, of Moses for the boss he does not appreciate, this was kind of known, and no one was really doing it anymore. But Michelangelo really didn't like it, this guy. And so it's sort of Michelangelo's parting last word to a bad boss to make sure that his tomb into eternity would be... Moses with, with horns, which you can still see today if you go to Rome. It is an admittedly roundabout way to talk about Moses. He didn't have horns, but he was just a bit scary when he comes down off the mountain. At least that's how people saw him. The way that Moses was treated after he comes down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments was everyone tried to keep him at an arm's length. There's this sense of like, Moses, you go talk to God and we'll be over here. Right? They were scared of him. Like, they said, if you're going to go pray to God, here, we'll make you a special tent so you can go talk to God over there and we're going to be over here because we don't want to get too close to God. God could get us. Ugh, right? And so what develops after this is uh, God says, Let, let's set aside Aaron and his sons to be priests. And, and this is what develops. At first in the tabernacle, which is their portable sort of worship space in the desert, and then in the, uh, in, in the temple that they built in Jerusalem, the way that worship worked was if I wanted to say thank you to God, good harvest, thank you God, I would take my, my offering, a pheasant, a lamb, whatever, and I would take it to a priest and I'd hand it off to the priest at the temple, and then they'd take it and they would go to God, because I, I don't want to get too close to God, I might get zapped, right? There's a sense of, of fear there. And, and if you think about... What we, the way we think about like worship today, where y'all are involved, and you say things, and you stand, and you do, and none of that was happening at this point. Like worship was, you showed up, you, you gave your, your lamb, and, and then uh, the priest would take it. There's no singing, there's none of that. They, they slaughtered the lamb, and it all happens in kind of silence, because they're not saying anything. And so you, kind of, you might just watch your lamb have a very bad day, and then you're, you're done. Like there's this, this fearful sense there. And so when the prophets start to show up about halfway through the time of the Old Testament, 
This is wild. Like the prophets show up and now instead of you just like dropping off your thank you note to God and then go, getting out of there so just in case God might zap you, now God's sending something for you to listen to. And you're not used to this. And so when the prophets start showing up and saying, thus saith the Lord, wow, that's crazy. God wants to talk to us, right? And then the, the next step that happens is Jesus shows up. And you could go right up to Jesus. It, like What people were used to up to that point was if you wanted to get to God, you had to go to a priest. And, and Jesus is walking around. And Jesus doesn't have like a ring of priests around him at like a 15 foot radius. So if you like wanted to get to Jesus, you would like go to a priest and say, can you please take a message to him? No, you just like walked up to him. And this is, this is new. And, and like Jesus doesn't go to someone, Jesus doesn't send messengers. When Jesus wants to invite the disciples to follow him, he doesn't have a bunch of priests around him and say, here priest, you go ask Peter if he'll follow me. He, he went to Peter himself. Like this is a, a new closeness. When, when it says uh, Jesus' name, Emmanuel, God with us, we lose track of what a change that has been. The sort of last step on this progression from here's my offering, get away from God as quickly as possible, to God wants to talk to us, to God with us, the last sort of step in this in the arc of scripture is that when Jesus is dying on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then he dies, the last sacrifice. And the veil in the temple rips. This takes a touch of explaining. In the temple, this place where priests gather to mediate your relationship to God, or you are, as you as Jews in that time period, there was the outer courtyard, and then there was the inner temple, and then there was the smallest room at the very back, and there was a veil that no one walked through. No one ever went in there except one time a year. And one time a year, the high priest would go into that room where the Ark and the, copy, the Ten Commandments were, and that, the high priest would make an offering and pray for God to forgive all of the people. Well, what has Jesus just done on the cross? Forgive him all of the people. So the veil tears. No longer will one person alone be the one who goes in to ask for forgiveness for all the people and you got to depend upon that person to do it for you. You don't need anyone to go before the Holy of Holies for you. Where, where do you go? You go straight to Jesus. Each of you, right? You don't, like, you, I'm, I happen to be up in front, and that's nice and all, I have the mic. But, that's, but what it boils down to is each of you can go to, to Jesus directly. And that's a very different, that's a different place than where we, we started out at the beginning of the Old Testament. Now, the first Christians were trying to make sense of this, and so we have the stories of, of some of them, Peter and John, for example, as they're trying to grapple with what this means. Like, their understanding of how to relate to God is shifted because of having followed Jesus. And so Peter, in the first letter that he writes, he's writing to a church that is struggling, and he's giving them advice to how to hold together, and he tells them that each of you, y'all included, are stones that build up together to build this amazing thing called church. And the way that you are built together is because you are a priesthood of believers. Each one of you are a priest. Each one of you can do what a priest does. What does a priest do? A priest is one, someone who goes to God. You can approach God without any intermediary. No one worships for you. Like, no one's going to do your worship for you. No one... <laughs> When we pass the plates, you put your offering directly in the plate. Like, you don't need someone to handle it first, right? No one is going to do your worship for you. You do it, because you come to God directly. Right? It is important that we also remember this is a communal context. You are priests individually, and, and you are priests for each other. Like, you can pray for each other. You can go to God directly and pray for someone else in the pews here. You can go to your neighbors and serve them in the name of Jesus. You don't need anyone to do it for you. You, you got it. Go, go and do this. It is the same sense that we read in, in, the God, uh, in, the, in John. And, and the Revelation, according to John, let, let's not dive into interpreting Revelation, but there's this moment in the middle of it 
When what we read is that the result of what Jesus ha having done is that people of every tribe and every nation are able to gather as priests, all able to be priests for themselves and for each other, approaching God and Jesus Christ directly. Now, this is a communal understanding. We are a priesthood of all believers. We are all empowered to approach Jesus directly on our behalves and to go out and serve others on behalf of Jesus. And this is part of what drives what we call the Reformation, this idea. Now, there are two sort of main things driving the Reformation. When Martin Luther starts this century-long argument that we call the Reformation. He nails 95 theses to the door of a church. One of the things he's angry about is indulgences, which is where this idea where the Pope has this like stash of forgiveness that he will sell you pieces of. And in a, this actually connects back to the Sistine Chapel, because the indulgences were actually what paid Michelangelo to do the Sistine Chapel. It, it's kind of sad that one of the darkest things the church has done paid to create one of the most beautiful things that the church did in the Sistine Chapel. But that's one thing Luther was angry about. The other thing that Luther was angry about was the way that priests had been elevated to be this sort of thing above all else. Like you can see it in the architecture itself. If you look at the architecture of church buildings, in the older ones, they have like the, the priests like in this huge, like chalice looking enclosure preaching down at people, right? Sort of preaching and the sense that the priest is elevated. And then you only got to have communion once a year. Who gave you Jesus? The priest. And how often could you come to Jesus? Once a year. And who decided if you were worthy to come to communion? The priest. Because you could only say confession to the priest. And he'd only let you do it once a year. Right? And there's this sort of... The priest had become, in the Middle Ages, 15th century or so, had become what had been left behind in the Old Testament. The priest was the one who was going to determine whether you got to come to God or not. And Luther reads his Bible and reads what Peter has to say and what John has to say and sees how Jesus approaches people directly and says, this doesn't work. This is not what the church was called to be. What Luther says is that each person, having been baptized and chosen to follow Jesus, is completely capable of coming to God themselves. You don't need anyone to get between you and Jesus. You just go directly. And so Luther wants, Martin Luther wants the, everyone to be able to hear each other's confessions. Like, he says, you can confess to any other Christian. You don't have to confess to the priest. Just confess to somebody so that you are de dealing with your own sins. And then come to communion. He wants communion to happen weekly. Because if it happens once a year, then it's, it's this rare thing. You get to come to God every once in a while, but only if you're really good and you deserve it. What happens if you come to this table weekly? You get to come all the time. Right? It changes how we view worship. Like You come to Jesus all the time, and isn't that wonderful? It, it, is frust it frustrated Luther greatly that he wanted everyone to come to communion weekly, and he could only get a lot of churches up to four times a year. And that's where a lot of churches stalled out. If you were raised going to church, having communion quarterly, who was raised having communion quarterly? Was that floating around? Yeah. Yeah. That was Martin Luther back in 1560. Because he couldn't convince people to come to communion weekly, or weekly, they got into quarterly, and only in the last 50 years have we gotten up to monthly, and he wanted us to be doing weekly all the entire time, and, and I agree, right? It's a practice of abundance to come to communion all the time. It reminds us that there is nothing between you and Jesus. Right? You are each part of this priesthood of all believers. This is part of who we are as Methodists as well. John Wesley would go out to preach to people going to the mines or going to factories, and he never went alone. He always brought a musician, either a flautist or an oboist. The flute makes sense. The oboe I've always found confusing. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but then he would always bring a third person. He brought just a regular person because someone could look at him and say, you're some highly trained, educated Yahoo. What do you have to say? And Wesley could look at the, his friend who'd say, no, listen to him or listen to her. 
he, he let women preach. He was a crazy, crazy man for his day, right? He, he would say, women, come along and preach as well. And, and wanted everyone to be able to hear. And when he started organizing groups of people who would gather weekly, he couldn't run them all. But he believed in a priesthood of all believers. So he had people, regular people, run these small groups. So, you might be wondering, so what's your job, Andy? Why, why do we bother having you? That's a good question. <laughs> if we are each part of this priesthood of all believers, each of you are fully capable to approach God directly. My job, when it's going well, is to train and teach and organize and then to get out of your way so that you can do it. My job is to help you do what you need to do more faithfully and then cheer you along as you go forth and do it. When Methodism thrived is when pastors have done exactly that. Through the, up, through the 1800s up till about 1910, if you wanted to find a Methodist pastor, you better move fast because they were circuit riders. And they would show up and they would preach at one place on a Sunday and then they'd have lunch with you and then they'd get on a horse and ride away right and what does that mean for the people of the churches like who is going to do the work of the church is it going to be the pastor no he just rode away and he's not going to be back for a month when Methodism first came to Missouri you know how many Methodist pastors there were for Missouri one how often do you think you got to see your pastor Right? And what that made very clear was, it's your church, priesthood of all believers, y'all can do this, go for it, I'll be back in a month and, and you can, we'll check in. Like, that's how Methodism thrived through the 1800s and then into about 1910, 1920, the Methodist pastors started building houses and settling down, and personally I do appreciate that. I've tried to ride a horse before, it hurt, I do not like to feel my large intestines move like that. I might not have been doing it right. The point being, when pastors settled down and started staying in one place for a while, it changed the dynamic and we started to lose that sense that each person is individually powered, empowered as a follower of Jesus to go and do the work of a priest, to approach God directly, and to go serve others in his name. And the pastor was there to train, teach, and organize, and then get out of the way. Churches that are thriving today are remembering this and practicing this anew. Remembering what Peter and John figured out from following Jesus. What Luther got all hot and bothered about when he was kicking. What Methodism once practiced. The pastor is the one who equips and trains. And then it's the people who are the priests. As First Peter puts it, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Each one of you is equally able to go out on behalf to go to go to Jesus directly and then to go out and serve in his name directly and this week it just so happens that you have an opportunity to do this right so if my job is to train and equip and organize I have something to do about that right now isn't that funny how that worked out I actually didn't plan it I just got really lucky and I prayed maybe not in that order um over there in the other room is a list of people who have committed to be part of this church at some point right now I could go to each one of them and I could s tell them I would love for you to come and, and we have a duty to care for you and we would love to hear how you're doing and we, we would love to see you again because we think uh, follow Jesus together matters you know how long it takes me to go down that entire list right? do you want me to have time to write a sermon for Christmas like it, it would take me a while and I could do it, but you are the ones who know them, right? They're your friends. My, not my friends yet, I haven't had the opportunity to meet them. And so, here, here is, uh, over there is the list of names, and here is your training. Right here, a little sheet of paper, each of you grab a piece. Please go find the person and do the following. Catch up, ask how their family is doing. Seriously, just shoot the breeze for a bit. It shouldn't be that hard, drink some coffee. Say something like, the Methodist Church is checking in with people to see how they're doing. Right? How are you doing? Are you at another church? Are you here? We have a meal this Sunday after worship. If you'd like to come, I'll come pick you up. And then give them this letter. 
I read this letter to you last week. It's a, it, it, it's a letter that basically says, hey, would love to see you. Let us know how you're doing. I even signed them. Really not. Right? And, and so that's your, that, you are equipped. You've got the tools. You've just been trained. And now you can go do this. Does, does this sound reasonable? Does this sound possible? Go talk to some of your friends, see how they're doing, and invite them to have a meal together. Like you can do this, right? And if you see a name that doesn't make sense to you, or I saw one name was crossed off, please leave a note as why you crossed it off so I know what's going on, because I, I can't organize what I don't understand. And uh, also know, we'll do this again. We're gonna, we have this heritage meal this next Sunday. Cook something that your grandma would have cooked, and please add some butter. It'd make her happy. Um, and in December 15th, we'll do cookies and carols again, and we'll have another opportunity. Because we don't just want to invite people just for the heck of it. We want to invite people and say, and here's the thing you can come to. Because if they've stopped coming to worship, we need to be able to say, and here's something you can come to. It's not just worship. There's something, there's more, and we want to share it with you. Now, I'm tempted to wrap this up by saying that I believe in you, and I believe you can do this. But what I believe is not what matters. What matters is what Jesus believes and proclaims in Revelation, that you have been made a kingdom of priests serving the Lord your God, and you're going to reign on earth. That's what we hear here, here in Revelation. You are, each of you, as a baptized and forgiven people, priests, fully able to go to Jesus directly, and fully able to go out and serve in his name. I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to what that's going to bring. Amen. I now invite you to stand with me and join as we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed.